Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? Morning. Another beautiful Sunday, right? Yeah. At least the rain is holding off, at least I hope until we get done here. But thank you for being here. Thanks for joining us in person. And of course, everybody that is online with us this morning. Um, before we get started, I, I do just want to welcome a special guest. Uh, where's Dale? Dale, can you Dale, can you stand up for me? I know you weren't prepared for this. This is Dale Jacobs. Dale was the first full-time pastor here at The Journey, pastored here for 32 years? 26 years. 26, which is absolutely crazy and amazing to be at one place for so long. Um, here's the cool thing. We are here today because of Dale. Um, so this is here for Dale. Thank you, sir. I'm sure if you want to know more history about the journey, just uh, catch Dale on the way out this, this morning. Uh, one other thing I want to bring to your attention is the playground. Uh, a few weeks ago, I shared with you that we are putting in an accessible ADA-approved playground here at the journey. You should have received an email if you're on our email list. And, um, you know, I, I told you that this, this playground is going in, in spring of 24, uh, about the same time the Caps and Wizards start to put break ground for their new arena in Alexandria. <laughs> which we're all sure is actually really going to happen. But, um, but we're kind of excited, I mean, maybe for that, if that happens. But, but we're really excited about this playground. And, uh, and I shared with you that our Christmas offering this year is going all towards this playground. And uh, we, we chose this playground because we wanted to, to make sure our kids here had a, a nice, fun, safe place to play, but our community had a place to come, and that all kids could come and play here. And so we're excited about that. But as you're thinking about generosity uh, for the end of the year here, you're thinking about ways that you can give over and beyond what you give to here at The Journey, we would love for you to give to this project. Uh, a couple things you can do. One, uh, if you want more information, go to thejourneynova.org slash playground. You can read more about it. If you've got questions, uh, you can actually email us, playground at thejourneynova.org. We would love to answer those questions for you. So make sure that you um, have a few kind of feeling led to, to move in that direction to give to this playground. Uh, unless you're a Grinch, I bet you have a Christmas movie you really like, right? So some of you are probably the classics, It's a Wonderful Life, yeah. uh, Miracle on 34th Street. Yeah. I'm not going to say anything about ageism here, but uh, <laughs> Rudolph. Some of you, maybe if you're more my generation, you probably like movies like A Christmas Story and Christmas Vacation and Elf, those are my go-to, right? So we all have them. And maybe for you, it's one of the 3,565 Hallmark Christmas movies. You got like one you've chosen. We talked about this a few weeks ago. You're like, hey, that's, that's my movie. And, uh, and, and there's a reason we love movies. Well, whatever movie you love at Christmas time, it's, it's the Christmas spirit that, that we have in it. It's the, the decorations and the music and the plot line, and it's all based around this, this Christmas time, right? And so it gets us into this mode of, of just loving the Christmas season. However, I'm here to tell you this morning, there's a genre of Christmas movies that get left out. And these are Christmas action movies. <laughs> there are movies that take place that are action movies that happen at Christmas time. And too often, they are left out of the debate of what's the greatest Christmas movie of all time, right? Some of those, thank you. I don't hear some amens on this. Prometheus is a Christmas movie. The Princess Bride is a Christmas movie. Jumanji is a Christmas movie. Of course, Gremlins is a Christmas movie. But let's talk about the greatest debate of all time. Is Die Hard a Christmas movie or not? All right. Yes. It happens during a Christmas party. It's got to be a Christmas movie. Now... I think there's something special when a movie can be action-oriented and still be based at Christmas, right? There's just nothing better that you could put together. But part of it is I just love action movies. And I love good action movies, and sometimes I love bad action movies just because I love the action. I love the tension that's there. I love all the conversations that happen. Of course, I like the battles and fights, and there's that plot line. There's that plot line. And usually the plot goes something like this. There is a person or a group of people that find that they are hopeless in some certain situation. And they're looking for someone to come and rescue them. They're looking for John McClane to show up and to help them to escape from the bad guys. But there's this hopelessness that's there, and the one thing that they're holding on to is hope. 
that at some point they'll be saved, at some point they'll be rescued. Well, I think that's true for you and for me, too. That we have this hope in our life that, that we want to hope on something when life feels hopeless. But there's a question in that for us. Where in your life have you felt hopeless? Or, or where in your life right now do you, do you feel hopeless? Maybe there's a family relationship that you've been trying to mend for all these years and, and that mending's just not happening. Maybe for you, it, it's your marriage. And no matter what effort you put in, no matter what time you put into it, it feels still feels like it's, it's crumbling around you. Or the job that you've been looking for just doesn't seem to come. You're still struggling with unemployment. Or you're experiencing this illness that just won't go away or this disease that has you captive or there's this spiritual tension that you have with God and and you're asking God where are you what are you doing in my life why aren't you answering these prayers that I keep praying or maybe it's the regrets from the decisions that we've made in our life and they're still affecting us today and so we're, we're at this place where we have this hopelessness inside of us and no answers are coming there's no direction that seems to be shown to us there's no guidance that's being given and so we're asking ourselves this question like where is hope in my hopelessness but that's what we're going to talk about today as we continue this christmas series called hope and as we begin today i actually want to take us back to the prophecy that we've been looking at over the past couple of weeks it comes out of isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 Isaiah writes this, All right then, the Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. The very first week of the series, I was talking about this, and I told you what was happening there with the nation of Israel. Uh, at this point, they'd actually split into two nations. You had the, the kingdom of Israel on the north end. You had the kingdom of Judah on the south end. So they were split. This, this whole nation was an absolute mess. There was oppression of the poor, and justice was rampant. And right on the, the doorstep was this enemy that was ready to come in and overthrow and overtake this land. And Isaiah shows up. God sends him, and he gives this prophecy. And the words from this prophecy, the name Emmanuel that's used here, it all had a purpose. And the purpose was to remind the Israelites, that there was hope in what felt like hopeless times. It's like Isaiah was kind of dangling hope in front of them and saying, hey, hold on to this because God is with you. Now, this all probably sounded really great, and they were probably like, hey, thanks, God, we really appreciate that. But then fast forward 700 years. We find ourselves in the first century. That hope's been dangled out there in front of the Israelites, but nothing's happened. In fact, for the last 400 years, God's been radio silent. No, no one's heard anything from God for those 400 years. I mean, how many of those Israelites had lost hope in that prophecy because of all these years that had passed? But here today, we're going to find ourselves in the first century. And I'm going to be honest with you. I think it was probably worse for the Israelites in the first century than it had been 700 years earlier. About 40 years before this, the Romans had come in and overthrown uh, that land. They had taken the land from the Jewish people. Now the Jewish people were underneath the Roman rule and all the Roman laws. There were incredible taxes that people had to pay to the Roman government. You had customs taxes and import taxes and export taxes and crop taxes and sales taxes. You had tolls that you had to pay everywhere you went. And you would think, we hear all those taxes, like hey, people must have been paid pretty well. well. The unemployment rate at that time was about 70%. And then you got to imagine all the religious expectations that the Jewish people had on them from the religious leaders, and they're carrying the spiritual burden too. I mean, again, I would say this is probably a harder time than it was for the Israelites 700 years earlier. And so imagine the Israelites in the first century are asking those same questions. Where is God? Hey, hey, God, did you forget about us? God, do you see what's still happening 
around us. God, you, you said you were going to give us hope, and, and we don't see this hope. All we can see is, is hopelessness. Where is this hope coming from? Well, then hope finally arrives, and we read about this hope in Matthew chapter 1, starting with verse 18. It says, This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. Let's kind of think about what's happening here with Mary and Joseph. Um, they probably grew up in, in the exact same town. Uh, towns in those days weren't transient like they are today, especially like at a place like this. Um, you know, most places, you, you were born there, you lived there, you died there. That was kind of the rhythm of, of life. And so Mary and Joseph are in this small town of Nazareth. They probably, other families know each other. They know each other. Probably grew up playing on the playground together. And Joseph probably tries to do everything he can to impress Mary. And then they get a little bit older, and they're in the local market. And, and, and Joseph does things and says dumb things because that's what hormone-infused boys do, right, to impress some young lady. And so there, there ends up being this connection between Mary and Joseph. And at this point, the parents jump in. I kind of like this. They jump in and they arrange this relationship. That was kind of the normal practice in, in those days. And many of us as parents would love to be able to do that for our, our children. But the parents jump in and, and they, they actually come together in this, this legal agreement. Uh, engagement in those days was a legal document. It was a legal agreement. You, you, you said, hey, these two are officially a now, when you and I think about engagement today in our culture, there's usually a ring. And someone says, will you marry me? And uh, hopefully the other person says yes. And so you're engaged, but, but in today's culture, you can bounce at any time. If you fall out of love or you're not quite sure you're ready for this or something else happens, you're like, hey, I, I, I can move on. And, and it doesn't mean that it's not a hard time and that words aren't expressed that probably shouldn't be expressed to each other and, and feelings aren't hurt, but, but it's not a legal document. It's not this legal agreement like it was for Mary and Joseph. And so when it says they're engaged here, this means this is a really serious relationship. But I bet Mary and Joseph had dreams. Dreams for what their house was going to look like. Dreams for the kind of job Joseph would hold. Dreams for the work that Mary would do. Dreams for the animals that they would take care of. Dreams of the kids that they would be blessed with. I mean, they have these dreams that are, again, like those Hallmark Christmas movies, right? They are just thinking about how beautiful and wonderful all the, all the Christmassy things you can think of and how great this life is going to be. But in the midst of this engagement, something happens. Mary gets pregnant. Now the issue is, one, that Mary and Joseph are not married at this point, so that would have been a problem. But the other issue here is that they have not known each other in the biblical sense, right? They have not been together to create this child, and so you, you've got a couple of issues that are here. And so Mary becomes pregnant, and this would have been very, very public. I mean, people would have been able to see this, and they would have been asking questions. And so I can't even imagine the conversations that Mary and Joseph are having. And then they're having with their parents, and then they're having with their siblings, and then they're having with aunts and uncles, they're having with their neighbors, because everybody would be talking about Mary being pregnant. And what does Mary do? She keeps telling the same story over and over again, that it never changes. Yes, I'm pregnant. Yes, it's not Joseph's. Yeah, it's not somebody else's. Oh, yes, I am serious. This is the Son of God that's in me. You have this unwanted pregnancy. And you have Mary that's telling, let's just be honest, this far-fetched story. And so you've got to kind of imagine that there are very few people that are believing what she's saying and, and, and what's happening as she tells them this over and over. And I think one of those people... It's probably Joseph. What do we just read? It says he was trying to figure out how to divorce her quietly. Look at verse 20. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Yeah, you ever made a pro-con list? 
Like you're trying to make a big decision about something in your life, about a house, about a car, uh, about a job, about a move, about the person you're going to marry. And, and so you put this pro-con list together and you list all the pros and cons. And it, it sounds kind of elementary, but I, I've done this a few times. And I can tell you that it, it actually brings some clarity, at least it did to, to Karen and I as we were trying to make some decisions in our life. But that's what I imagine here as I read those words uh, about Joseph as he considered this, that he probably did a pro and con list. Here's all the reasons I should marry, marry. Here's all the reasons I shouldn't marry, marry. And based on what we just read, I'm guessing those cons way outweighed the pros that he would have written down. What it seems, he's made up his mind. He knows what he's going to do. But again, the thing about Joseph, and, and I just want to let you know, I, I know Mary dealt with a lot, and, um, but, but this today, I'm just kind of putting, putting ourselves in, in the place of, of Joseph and just uh, the hopelessness that he probably felt. Because he had all these expectations for his life with Mary. He had all these dreams for this, this marriage and, and what this was going to look like for these two, and and the hope, hope that he had. And that hope had turned into hopelessness. And he decides to move on from this engagement. But what do we see here? This angel shows up and changes everything. It changes everything for Joseph, for Mary, for Israel, for humanity, for you, and for me. Look at the rest of verse 20. Joseph Son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. What's this angel doing? This angel is telling Joseph, All those fears you have, Joseph, let them go. All the hope that you've lost, let God show you what hope truly looks like. That hopelessness you feel, there is hope through this child. God wants you to marry Mary because this child is your hope. It's humanity's hope. And so the angel says, Mary, Mary, name this son Jesus. And then the angel says, here is his mission. Here is that hope that was dangled in front of the Israelites 700 years earlier. This is the hope for Israel right now. This is your hope, Joseph, and this is hope for humanity until Jesus comes back again. And I believe that's why Matthew throws back in this, this prophecy to reiterate who this son was. Verse 22, all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Like this birth is a fulfillment of that prophecy. And even though the Israelites may have felt like they had been forgotten after all these years, here is God who is saying the birth of Jesus is that hope that you have been looking for. That hope has arrived. Well, how does Joseph respond to what the angel says? Look at verse 24. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. What does Joseph do? Joseph does exactly what God has asked him to do. But, but let's just kind of stop here for a moment. And let's think, let's think about this marriage. And think about how this marriage begins. I'm not sure this is quite the way that you and I would want a marriage to, to start. Um, Karen and I talk to people all the time, and we're always amazed when people say their first year of marriage was their best year. Like, it was great. It was wonderful. Man, for us, it was so hard. It was difficult. It wasn't terrible, but it was difficult, right? And so, we're, you know, you're trying to learn to, to live with somebody and be around somebody all the time. It's just so different, and, and it's taken us time to, to get beyond that. But but I think that ours was hard. And then I read and think about Joseph and Mary and how difficult that first year, in fact, those first few months would have been for them. 
I mean, think about how this marriage begins. Uh, we go to the book of Luke, and we read that Mary and Joseph have to go to Bethlehem. Now, they live in, in Nazareth, and this is about a 90-mile trek from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. And, and they didn't have a plane they could jump on. They didn't have any, any trains they could, they could ride. They couldn't call an Uber. They couldn't charge up their Tesla. They couldn't do any of that. And in fact, sort of the images we have of her riding on the donkey, we, we don't know that that's true. It's very likely that she had to walk from Nazareth to Bethlehem, this 90-mile trip. Now, there could have been all kinds of different variables here, um, but some say that this may have taken them on the low end four days. Um, I don't know if you've ever traveled with a pregnant lady before, but uh, maybe on the high end, a, a, a week and a half. Um, it's kind of difficult, right? And, and so she's pregnant, and you're going to have to stop at all these different times so she can take care of, you know, get some food and use the restroom. Probably stopped at this place right here, Sheets, <laughs> probably. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> This is my dad Christmas joke for the day. So, uh, but they had to stop, right? They had to stop, and she had to take a break. And, uh, and again, it totally, it totally makes sense. But she's carrying this baby that's not even yours. It's the Messiah. This is supposed to be God's son. And so you take this trip down to Bethlehem. And, and you get to Bethlehem, and you're not there for a vacation. You're not there for a family reunion, right? Why are you there? You are there for a census of the Roman government so they can figure how much money to charge you in taxes. Sounds like a wonderful time to go to a place like Bethlehem. And then they get there and the place is packed. I'm betting that the homes they used to stay in of relatives are full of people because everybody is called to the the hometown of their family. And those those homes are full and and the inns are full and the hostels are full. There's no room for them. And I Maybe he pulls up his tablet like, hey, I'm going on VRBO, Mary, see what I can find. And he finds a stable. And they end up staying in the stable, a place where animals lived and they ate. And this is the place that the Son of God was born. The son that Joseph is told to name Jesus, and who's also told has sort of this strange mission to live out for his life. Now, I, I don't know about you, but that's probably not quite the way I'd want to start my, my married life. And so once again, I, I'm putting myself in the place of Joseph, and I'm thinking through everything that he's experienced and everything that, that's going on, and he's got all these expectations, he's got all these plans, he's got all this hope, and all of that is gone, and I'm sure he's asking questions. Is this what my life's going to look like now? Why did I get stuck in the middle of this? What is it about this child? Now, we're really not told where Joseph really begins to comprehend everything that's happening. Um, But I'm sure that he's feeling this intense hopelessness in his life. And in it, he's looking for hope. And in the midst of this hopelessness, what do we see happens? Hope arrives. That Joseph is reminded that God is with him at the birth of Jesus. I don't know how you answered a little bit earlier, but go back to that question. What feels hopeless to you? I mean, besides the commanders ever winning another Super Bowl, what... (laughs) What feels hopeless to you in your life? Is it your marriage? Is it dealing with the loss of someone close to you? Is it unemployment? Is it your life? And how do you handle that hopelessness that you, that you feel and you experience? You know what we do too often is we take matters into our own hands. We say, hey, if I'm hopeless and I'm going to do everything I can to kind of manufacture hope. And I, I think we're, we're really taught that in, in our lives, that when we feel hopeless, we need to figure it out our, ourselves. And, and I wonder if we kind of like living life that way. I, I don't need anyone else to help me. I don't need to, to worry about this thing called hope because I can do this on my own. And so maybe there's this thinking in our minds that, you know what, I've got money. 
And since I got money, I, I can pay for everything I, I need. That, that, that whatever hopelessness I may feel, I, I, can, I can find hope through stuff. And so we think our money is going to help us through those hopeless moments. Or maybe for someone else, you look at yourself and you're like, I, I'm smarter than, than most people. I, I can, I'm smart enough to, to figure this out on my own. I, I can take care uh, of this on my own. Or, or maybe you think about yourself as emotionally strong. And because I'm more emotionally strong than most people, I'll find a way through this. But I can promise you there's going to come a point in time that when you're experiencing hopelessness in your life, that you're going to find this place where you're not going to be able to get beyond that hopelessness. That it doesn't matter how much money you have or how smart you are or how emotionally strong you may think you can be, that that hopelessness will get to this place where it feels like it's never going to go away. And what do we do then? Where do we turn at this point? Well, it's usually at this point in our lives that we figure out we need to be saved. That if we go back to those movies, those action movies I was talking about a little bit earlier, that we need to be rescued. That's why I love how N.T. Wright, a theologian and author, put it. He said, Christmas is the moment when God launched a divine rescue mission of humankind. Here's the deal. Israel wanted to be rescued. They, they wanted to be saved from the Roman occupation. They wanted to be saved from the taxes and the poverty and the, uh, the unemployment. They wanted their land back. They wanted their people back. They wanted their way of life back. But Jesus was not born to save Israel from Rome or, or to save them from poverty or unemployment. Jesus was born to give them hope and their hopelessness. What did Joseph want? Joseph wanted to be rescued too. He, he wanted to be rescued from this situation that he found himself in the middle of. He wanted to be rescued from this relationship that he can't fully grasp that he has with, with Mary. He wants to be rescued from all these expectations that he had for his future that had now been dashed, that had been taken away from him. But, but Jesus was not born to save Joseph. From everything that was happening in his life, Jesus was born to give Joseph hope in his hopelessness. Here you and I are 2,000 years later, and guess what? We look at our world, and it's easy to say our world is hopeless. Because everything we see, everything we read, everything we're told, it just all sounds hopeless. And then, and then even the, the conversations that we have one-on-one -on -one with people, so often people are just talking about how hopeless their lives seem. And, and then maybe we look internally at ourselves and we're thinking to ourselves, you know what, I feel, I feel that same hopelessness myself. We'll know that Jesus was born to give us hope in our hopelessness. That's why I love what N.T. Wright says there. The birth of Jesus was a divine rescue mission for humanity. The birth of Jesus was to remind us that we are rescued, we are saved in our hopelessness. And that divine rescue is for you and for me. No matter what life may throw our way, no matter what decisions that, that we've made in our life that still cause us trouble to this day, no matter what hopelessness we may feel deep down, this divine rescue is a reminder of the hope that God sent to us through Jesus. Which really takes us back to that mission the angel told Joseph about. You're going to have a son. You're going to name him Jesus. And his mission is to save people from their sin. Now, that name was actually pretty important in this. You know, we have Emmanuel, God, with us, but Jesus in the Hebrew means he saves, he, he rescues. And, and the idea is that here is Jesus who, who saves us, who rescues us from ourselves. And it's not just here in this moment from what the angel says. We actually read this in the book of John. There's a passage there that you're probably familiar with, even if you're not religious at all. You've probably seen it at a football game or heard it somewhere, but it's John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. 
Now, that's a great passage. But we too often, we forget about number 17. Because verse 17 says so much too. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Uh, the gift of Jesus is a reminder to us that no matter what we are facing in our lives, no matter what we are going through, no matter what we are experiencing, no matter the decisions that we've made in our past that are still affecting us to this day, no matter the decisions we're going to make today that will affect us tomorrow, no matter how hopeless we may feel in our world today, no matter how often we keep giving in to sins in our life, the gift of Jesus, the birth of Jesus should remind us that God is with us. And because God is with us through Jesus, we are saved, we are rescued. That's you, that's me, and that's all humanity. That the birth of Jesus brought hope to the hopeless. That there's something better for us. That our tomorrows be better than our today. That there's hope in that hopelessness. And so wherever you may be, sort of in your spiritual journey, may we be reminded that we are saved and rescued because of who Jesus is. Because Jesus was a gift to you, to me, and to all humanity. And so this morning, as we kind of think about how hope rescues us through the birth of Christ, let me... Let me share with you a couple of next steps that, that may be helpful for all of us as we, we think about this at this time of, of year. For, for some here today, maybe this is a reminder of, of the hope that you need. Uh, that, that you've lost hope. And it could be brokenness in, in yourself or in relationships. It could be tensions uh, between you and, and someone you're close to. Maybe it's just internal struggles that you're you're facing and and you're trying to figure this out on yourself and whatever you're doing is not working you're searching for something to put your hope in well, let this be a reminder to you that jesus is our hope that jesus saves us and rescues us in our hopelessness and so maybe today as we finish up our time together you know, our prayer team is going to be up here. They would love to just pray over you. They would love to just pray hope over you. That reminder that Jesus saves, that, that Jesus rescues us from our hopelessness. And so maybe that's what you need this morning. For others, uh, maybe you're at this place in your life where you're trying to figure out this spiritual journey, and, and you want to take that first step in that spiritual journey. You've, you've experienced that hopelessness. You've, you've experienced trying to fix this on your own with, with money and with your intelligence and with how strong you are emotionally, and, and nothing seems to be working. Those, those, that hopelessness is, is still present in, in your life. And maybe you're finally at the place like, all right, all right I, I, I need to be saved. I need to be rescued. And for you, that may be taking that step of baptism. To taking that step and saying, hey, I'm ready just to, to be rescued by hope through Christ. And we'd love to talk to you about that. You can take that QR code in front of you uh, and let us know. You can fill out the connection card. Uh, you can go to our guest tent. They would love to talk to you about that. Joel loves to talk to people about baptism. Uh, email him, joel at thejourneynova.org and say, hey, I, I've got questions. I want to know more. We We'd love to sit, help you take that step to fully be rescued through that hope that comes through Christ. But then lastly, there are some of us, we've experienced that hope. We've been through those hopeless moments. And we know how dark those hopeless moments can be. And, and we understand that, that hope saves us. Hope rescues us. We, we have Jesus in our life and and yet at the same time, we know so many people, so many people in our lives who are experiencing this hopelessness. I'm going to give you a challenge if this is you. I'm going to challenge you to invite someone to church for Christmas Eve services next Sunday afternoon. We already talked about this, 1, 2, 30, and 4. And here's why. Um, Christmas Eve services are the number one throughout the year that if you invite someone who does not go to church 
they will more than likely show up for. You know why? It's the Christmas tradition. Right? There's something about that. They may not go to church the whole year, but there's something of, of the Christmas traditions and being together. And, and even though they may be trying to figure out this Jesus thing, there's, there's something about being in a place like this that talks about the Christmas story. It just kind of puts this sort of this icing on top of the cake for them. And you have this incredible hope to share with someone else. And so my challenge to you is to invite someone that you know who's experiencing that hopelessness to come and know what hope is as we celebrate next Sunday. Look, our world feels hopeless. It experiences this hopelessness, and it's all around us, but, but I think there's one thing we all understand, that we have been rescued by hope. We have been saved by hope because of the gift of Jesus from God.